And we're live. We're live, we're live, we're live. Welcome to Black Wealth Aspirations. I'm Tiffany about Denise there. We're talking about entrepreneurship and wealth. One of my two favorite things, if I'm being honest, and I am. Uh, I'm super excited. So welcome to our Black Wealth Aspirations Live series. This is number two of three, Dose of Trace, <laughs> a little Spanish, um, of live videos where we'll discuss building wealth in the Black community. I am Tiffany, better known as the Budget Nista, your favorite financial educator um, and a businesswoman myself of currently three businesses, three thriving businesses. Um, so a few things real quick. We're going to be, you know, we're going to be dropping knowledge, honey. So let's do a notebook check. Go ahead and get you a notebook real quick. Pull it out. Find it. Go ask the kids to pick you up one. Um, and share, 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 share. I want you to share this video. Share the love. Put it on your social media. Text it to your, your sister, your cousin, your mama and them, okay? But if you know me, you know I always have notes. I'm going to read a quick legal disclaimer because, you know, we have to be on the up and up. This video is provided for educational and informational purposes only. It's not intended to be, nor should it be construed as investment, insurance, financial, tax, or legal advice. Please consult with your own advisors for such advice. AKA, I'm not your doctor, your lawyer, your cousin. I'm your internet cousin, but I'm just smart brown girl. <laughs> but ultimately, we want you to lean into your own um, advisors for, for that kind of advice. Okay? Go get your notebook. Rusa, tell the kids, the partner, whomever, quiet down because we're going to get into it. I cannot wait to talk to y'all tonight about money and especially entrepreneurship because it's really one of my passions. Okay. But I want you, let's talk about like, I want to like really lean into a little history. Like you, if you have ever been in any one of my lives or, you know, like I type out, like I used to be a school teacher. So I always have the lesson plan typed out. So if you see me like looking down or whatever, it's because child, I come prepared and ready. We got pages of notes. That's why I want you to have your, your notebook ready. So here's a little history for you. First things first, we're going to kick off the conversation with a little history. Did you know um, in the 1900s to the 1930s, that's considered the golden age of black businesses. At the time, organizations with regional, national, and international reach, such as insurance companies, financial institutions, manufacturing companies, and beauty enterprises were among the companies that were thriving, honey, thriving. Still, racial discrimination and reconstruction resulted, it resulted in underemployment and, um, and unemployment of Black people. In order to ensure the well-being of their community, Black people turned to entrepreneurship, and it really paid off. Isn't that exciting? I feel like we do that today, right? Things still have not changed. Black entrepreneurship decreases the wealth gap, and Black businesses positively impact the communities around them. We sure do. A study by the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation found that the wealth gap, this is such a, this is going to blow your mind, lean in. The wealth gap between black and white Americans is 13 to 1. That's the wealth gap between black and white Americans. Now, the wealth gap between black and white business owners is only 3 to 1. That's what business can do. Isn't that incredible? As an entrepreneur, you know, you've likely put in the work to establish and grow your business. Now you need a plan to ensure your assets are protected so that the money your business has made can work for you, your family, and for generations to come. That's what we're going to talk about today. Again, checking in with the notebook. Also checking in if you're part of the replay crew, meaning you're watching this later. Um, we want to honor you. Hey, you're not late, sis. You're right on time. Get your notebook as well because you're going to need it. Share this as well. Um, and so I want to ask you a few questions. I want you to really lean into the chat, right? It's a new year for you and a new year for your business. Um, before we start talking about planning for your financial future, I want to know specifically in the chat, and I'm going to read some of them out loud. What are your 2023 goals for you, your family, and your business? Let me know in the comments, you know, what are your goals for 2023, right? And how do you plan to achieve those goals, right? So I want you to let me know in the chat. And also too, just throughout, if you have any questions about something that we're talking about, drop it in the chat, you know, we'll address some of that later. But I want to know in the chat real quick, what are your goals for you and your family and your business for 2023? Um, and even if, like I said, you're watching the replay, like one of the things that I like to do is I like to use the, 
the feedback that you guys give me to create resources that are tailor made specifically for you. So if you're watching the replay or you're watching live, part of the live crew, hey, live crew, which is awesome. It's not just I want you to post in the chat just because it's because this is the information that I can use then to create um, tools and resources that are tailor made specifically for your needs. Does that make sense? So again, what are your financial goals for 2023 and how do you plan to achieve those goals? Okay. But we have a special guest because I'm not here alone. I'm super excited. She's a dream catcher. She's a mentee. She's awesome. Her name is Marcia Cork. Marcia Cork, she, she brands herself as the change coach. Um, she's a, a pro C, I hope I'm saying it right, certified change manager practitioner and a grief recovery specialist certified in the grief recovery method. Um, the only evidence-based grief support program in the world. She helps people navigate change, but also the grief from major life events. Did you know you can grieve not just the loss of someone, but you can grieve a loss of like a job or moving. And so this is something that Marcia leans into. She also produces and hosts a podcast called, Ooh, those F and C words, right? Oh, all those conversations are about to are about change and navigating that change with confidence for her clients on the other side of that change and um, and grief, but finding it difficult to tell their stories. She coaches them through constructing and communicating that narrative. Um, many of their stories are even featured on the podcast. So as Maria, as um, Maria, Marcia, I'm sorry, Marcia, as Marcia comes up, let me see some of your, um, your goals. Marcia, come on into the room. Um, let's see. Um, Nishi wants to grow my business and build financial wealth. Um, let's see some of the other ones that people say. Um, to expand my business more, invest my earnings to work with my family. Love that. What else? Um, let's see. Let's see. Oh, Lavender. She said she grieved her free time um, when she took in her grandchild. Mm. Okay. She wants to take her family on a cruise, save $4,800. This is Nafisa and start her special education consulting business. Make a hundred K. This is Nakisha. We got a lot of ads in here. Nakisha. She wants to make 180,000 plus. Okay. These are really great goals. Please keep them coming. Welcome, Marcia, to the room. Hello, hello. <laughs> Thank you for having me. See, I brought a friend in. So you know it's a good time. Replay or live crew, bring a friend in. Okay? Share this, share this, share this, because really sharing the wealth is one of the best ways that we can ensure that we all have access. So I have some, like, we're going to chat because you're a business owner, just like me. Mm -hmm. You know, you're someone interested in building wealth, just like me. Um, and so I would love, like, just some perspective about um, business ownership and, and building wealth. Like what made you think to yourself? Is that one of the reasons why you started kind of like, you know, creating a business for yourself? To build wealth? Yes. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it became a goal. Okay. No, initially I, it was out of necessity. So if, okay. if, if there was anything I wanted to claim, it was my time. Okay. So at the time I was pregnant. Okay. Um, I knew nothing about parenthood. I knew nothing about having to solidify childcare in advance and get on wait lists and things like that. Mm -hmm. So when it came time for me to go back to work, I thought I could just call someone up and say, okay, my child is going to come there Monday. <laughs> and that was not the case. Mm -hmm. So, um, out of necessity for me to be able to be home with my child, I started consulting and contracting with my previous employer. That was how it started. Yeah, I love, and you know, I feel like a lot of um, businesses are built from necessity because same, I lost my job in 2009 as a teacher when the recession hit and my school, which is nonprofit, no longer had the funds. Um, and so I just was just trying to make ends meet. Mm -hmm. um, but over time, I realized I didn't fully get it. Even though I went to, I have my my bachelor's of science in business with a concentration in marketing. Mm -hmm. I did not fully understand the power that business had to grow wealth. Okay. You know, like I just was like, yeah. this is enough to pay bills, and then it started to grow. And I thought, wait, there's an unlimited capacity of how much I can actually make, and it blew my mind because I was used to, you know, being a teacher. This is what you make. This yeah. is what it's capped at. But in business, there is the cap is you. You're the yes. ceiling, you yes. know? Um, so that was a misconception that I had about business that I had not really thought about the ability to grow well, that there was no real cap. But I would love to know what are some myths or misconceptions that you've heard about um, finances and being a business owner? Like before you started your business, what did you think it was going to be like as it relates to your finances and money? So 
<clears throat> because I was thrown into it, I can't really say there was any preparation. It was like just being thrown to the wolves, blind leading the blind. I did. Mm. I can't. When you say misconceptions or myths, I think I had more misunderstandings mm. than anything. Okay. There was just so much I didn't know about entrepreneurship or being a small business owner. I didn't have those models, those representations growing up. You know, I, okay. I grew up in a blue collar family. Um, you know, we, we've always been told to get a good education and then get out there and get a good government job. So, <laughs> so that is the climate that I grew up in. I didn't see solid examples of entrepreneurship or anyone to guide me and say that you can have a lucrative um, you know, business and a good livelihood doing this. Mm -hmm. So I've only really begun to see that now, you know, mm -hmm. I can look to my left and to my, my right now and see all kinds of examples of entrepreneurship and seeing that we can do it well, make money and, you know, plan for our futures with that. But that was not, that was not the case for me growing up. And it wasn't the case when I started my business. So like I said, it was out of necessity. I thought it was going to be, you know, just some short term contracting and consulting and some good money to, you know, kind of keep us afloat while I solidified childcare. And that actually turned into to present day. Because <laughs> so we had like kind of like some pre-chat and you mentioned something that I thought is a myth for many people, which is like how in order to be successful in entrepreneurship, you have to overwork and overwhelm. Is that something mm -hmm. fair that like for, for to be, to reach a certain level of success that like, it requires the overwork and the overwhelm. Is that a fair myth that you think many people had that maybe you even had? That's definitely a myth. Um, but it, I think it's a philosophy for some people. Mm -hmm. A lot of people do really believe in that, that hustle culture. I sleep when I die. Mm -hmm. That's never been me. Good. You know, like I said, I did this because I wanted to be home with my daughter. Okay. So it was me being able to have the, the life, the lifestyle and the, the balance that I wanted. Okay. Right. So I can't say that I ever subscribed to that. Good. But the 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 main misunderstandings that I had were just about basic things like structure. You know, if I'm going to do this, then I can I can say that I'm a small business owner and mm -hmm. know something about business structure, know something about, um, you know, which route do I want to go with that? Do I want to be a sole proprietor? Do I want to mm -hmm. be an LLC? Um, you know, things like when and how to pay myself. And if okay. there are, you know, tax considerations to consider you know, with that, that's what I didn't know. OK, so initially I just thought I would be someone who could, you know, charge a rate, <laughs> make a little money. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody. Girlfriend, let me tell you something. When people start. So we're going to we're going to dispel that myth and the second myth. So okay. myth number one, you got to overwork and overwhelm to be successful. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're going to dispel that that like does it require, you know, like hard work? You know, success indeed does it require overwork and overwhelm. I do not believe so. I mm -hmm. have. I subscribe to the overwork and overwhelm, and certainly I generated success, but then something happened where they called us, write this down for you in your notebook crew, write this down. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, yes. Good. You see? Marcia is <laughs> notebook crew. So one of the things I learned is that there's something called the law of diminishing returns. Hmm. So what that is, is that there is a, a point when something good actually starts to produce some bad things. Yeah. You know, so like, let's just say you drink water a lot. Great. Water's great for you. But there is a point where water, you can literally drown yourself on the inside because you drink too much water. Mm -hmm. It's the law of diminishing return. And in business, that's what I did. Here was my goal. I shot so far past my goal. I became unhealthy. I became unhappy. I became mm -hmm. overworked and overwhelmed. And so it actually became less productive and less successful. Yeah. So that's myth number one. You don't have to overwork and overwhelm. Work hard, yes. Overwork, no. Yeah. So the misconception number two, that you can just kind of set up shop and not have this foundation of like, I have a separate checking account for my business and my separate checking account. That's like the number one thing. People start a business and don't get to the business of the business. Yes. And thinking that they don't have to do that right away, but you do, you know? And so like, I would love from the audience, like, you know, you know, any small business owner out there listening, what have you found challenging? What information do you wish you learned earlier? Let's start yeah. to dispel some of those myths and get some of your questions answered. You know, um, um, someone said like they have to keep their real job until their dreams pay their bills. Certainly that can be a challenge because I was forced out of my job. So I didn't mm -hmm. really have that option. Mm -hmm. um, 
But for some people that it's going to be a real, a real, unless you save up, you know, your three to six months or a year, then you might have to keep your job and seesaw, you know, yeah. until you could take that leap. Um, no, I would love like, you know, what are some misconceptions? What are some, uh, oh, someone said that they, um, you won't make any money the first um, one to two years, get, get rich quick. Um, that's not always the case. Now, Here's the thing. So, so uh, let me ask you, Marcia, did you make money within the first um, couple of years of business right away or did it take a while? I made money. Okay. I, I can't say I replaced my salary. Okay. Definitely not. But for me, because I'm a very disciplined person, what that taught me was how to plan in advance. Okay. So what I ended up doing um, was learning to live on less. So I, I always believe there's something good that comes out of it. So for that first year, of course, because I was having a baby, I already had money stacked for, okay. you know, just being on um, a maternity leave. But working from that maternity leave, knowing that now I have to leave my job, I just learned to live on less and okay. plan for that. So when I started consulting, when I, um, I started teaching, so I was a um, adjunct professor okay. and I taught evenings and weekends. So when that money came in, I didn't touch it. Okay. So that was icing on the cake. So for that entire year, I did not touch any of the money that I made from teaching. Mm. So I knew that I could look ahead to the next year and that, that I could continue to be on my own because now I already know how much money I have to live off the next year. Okay. And that I love that. Because yes. you learned, you you dispelled another myth that I've seen a lot of new entrepreneurs have, that in order to be an entrepreneur, you got to be a pure entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. I'm only living off what this business makes. So, let me tell you something, sis. When I was starting Budget East, the Budget East was like money where? Yeah. I was babysitting. I was tutoring. Everything but the Budget East was making me money. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So I was not a pure entrepreneur for the first few years of business yeah. and that's okay. So I'm, that was a myth that I'm glad you dispelled early for yourself. Um, so we have some questions that have come in about like some challenges that the audience are facing. So um, D says, how do you balance the day job while building your business? This is not easy. You know, you're going to probably have to carve out time before and carve out time after and on weekends. And so this is when the work can feel a little overwhelming. Um, D. And so you're going to really have to. So for me, I had to ask myself, what do I cut? You know, and so I cut, I didn't go out as much with friends. Um, not to say, or, or I invited friends over, but I would cut out. I had to create time space in the beginning, uh, middle. And for, for me, I would, because I taught preschool and the kids would take a nap for two hours during the day. And that was kind of my free time. I actually worked. I don't suggest you working working on your side hustle at your job, unless you have like that, you know, your lunch break, like that, those two hours are basically essentially my lunch break. And so um, that's what it kind of looks like. And then eventually, you know, saving up enough. So you have a runway to take a leap, yeah. you know, so that's what it's going to look like. So you might, let's just say you're making $4,000 a month and your business gets to say $2,000 a month and it's paying you that you're like, Oh, there's a gap of a 2000, yeah. but I have six months worth of savings. I'm going to take the leap to see in this six months, can I finally use this extra time not being at my job to take this leap? Um, somebody else um, um, said that what they wish they had known was that this journey is very lonely. Oh, we're going to talk about that, Marcia. Yes. Right? Unless you have others who are willing to support you during the, along the way. Marcia, your hubby right now is cooking dinner. You say you can smell it, child. Mm. <laughs> you have a supportive person, and yet, do you still feel lonely on the journey? Yes. See? Mm -hmm. Yes. One hundred percent. Yeah. One thousand percent. Yes. When do you feel the loneliness? I feel I, constantly. OK, because like I said, I've already given you the history. I didn't have anyone else doing this. Right. So I am there's so much I don't know and I don't have, for lack of a better word, a support system. I know the importance now of surrounding myself with people who know more. Right. Mm -hmm. I have I call it, you know, my informal advisory board. So mm -hmm. when I need an accountant, when I need an attorney, it's also be, being able to afford these things, too. So when you're starting mm -hmm. out and you're pinching every penny, Girl. you don't want <laughs> I've got to, my you don't want to invest. Right. Yeah. Right. You but when people say it takes money to make money, yes. it's it really is true. You have to be willing to put money into those resources in order to make the business. But, but what Marcia is saying is right, that one, 
it's hard to say, but there is a lot of loneliness along the way because oftentimes you're charting the path. You're literally with the machete for those of you from the from the Caribbean or Africa or one place. Back in the day, your grandpa, he was charting the path. He's just chopping down as he goes. Yeah. So oftentimes you are with the machete in the woods, chopping down as you go. Yeah. But I do highly suggest, as Marcia said, that you start to seek out and network, you know, yeah. put this in your notebook. That like, you know, there are Facebook groups that, you know, if you're a dream catcher and you're in the, in the Facebook group for dream catchers, great. But there's also Facebook groups for literally entrepreneurs. There's Facebook groups for cat sweaters. Shoot, there's Facebook groups for everything, yeah. you know, so you can find a network to lean into. So you're not, it doesn't um, erase the loneliness, but it helps to have people, peers along the way. Um, I do have a question for you, quick, quick question for you, Marcy, as we talk about this is that, um, so now, so you have this business and you're, you're right in the very beginning, it takes money to make money, you know, and you were talking to me about like, you're now using the very attorney that I use, Tony Moore, who's awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. how have you protected or how are you planning to protect your business asset? Now that you've moved into a place where your business is making good money and you're like, let me get myself an attorney. So I know that's part of the answer, but like, what does protection and protecting your business asset look like for you? Yeah. So <laughs> I know when we're having money conversations, it doesn't feel like talking about trademark protection and copyright protection is about mm -hmm. money, but it is. Mm -hmm. It is. And that's what I'm focused on right now. So all of the ideas, concepts, the, the framework that I come up with to teach, you know, the model that I come up with to teach, mm -hmm. that has to be protected. And mm -hmm. I really wouldn't have thought about it before. So all of the guidebooks, you know, workbooks, ebooks, all of those things that come out that actually document my process. Mm -hmm. Or I was telling you before, my hashtag different, better, more things mm -hmm. like that. You say them, you post them, you don't realize mm -hmm. they need to be protected until somebody takes them. I mean, let me tell you something. <laughs> the budget needs to came out and whew, it's only by God's grace mm -hmm. because my friend of mine, I had no money. And he was like, you need to trademark the word Virginista because it didn't exist before. And I said, who has money? I remember Dennis. I'll never forget. But he was a uh, he was in the, um, the music industry. and He just seemed too much. And he was like, Tiffany, you need to trademark. I said, I don't have any money. He said, you have a credit card. I was like, ah. mm -hmm. so it was like two hundred and fifty dollars or two hundred seventy five dollars, something to that effect. He said, I'll, walk, I'll help you walk through the trademarking process. You just have to do it yourself online. And the um, the trademarking, like, I guess, um, the people like the whatever the the governmental agency that helps you trademark actually assigns you an attorney. And so like I, I did a ton of things wrong. That attorney helped me walk through some of the basic things. Trademarked it a year later. So I use Google um Google alerts for the budget nista. So okay. like if you don't use this, do it, write it down in your notebook. Mm -hmm. Literally go to Google Alert, sign up. It's F R E E free, our favorite. <laughs> And you put it like, I, I have a Google alert for Tiffany Aliche, a Google alert for Liberty Academy, for the Budgetista. A year later, ping, the Budgetista comes up on a Google alert on a well-known um, bank, right? And I said, oh, they're showcasing me? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Girl, I pulled it up. That was not me. Um... It was this beautiful Asian woman who was super cute. And it said, meet the Budgetista. I said, but that's not me. Mm. <laughs> that's not me. But Hot I had not... Woman. I had trademarked it. So before I could even reach out to them within 24 hours, so somebody must have done a Google search and found a trademark within 24 hours. It was down. I didn't even have to tell them, but it was okay. down. But can you imagine? I don't have the money to go up against a huge financial institution. Yeah. Like, but I trademarked it and so I owned it, you know? Yeah. So that's super important. Um, and there was something you said, I think it was on the podcast. Mm -hmm. um, oh goodness, I'm going to get it wrong, but you can explain it. You can okay. explain it. But it was something like, when you don't take action now, it costs more later. Yes. Yeah. So it's um it's, it's basically something I, I that I don't feel bad um about uh mistakes that I make now. Mm -hmm. So I have made fifty dollar mistakes, and at the time I was like fifty dollars is so much. Yeah. Yeah. And then I realized later, like, oh, if I did not learn that fifty dollar mistake, it would have cost me five hundred dollars right. two years later, five thousand right. four years later, you know, fifty thousand. 20 years later. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. And, so, and that's the mindset. So for yeah. something like this, so for trademark protection, when you don't, you know, you might put it off just because you don't know the process. Yeah. We do that too. Yes. Right. We put things off because we, we don't know where to start and we don't know what to do. So what would cost $250 and you put it off. Now someone else owns it and you can't use it anymore. Well, how much money do you lose now that you have to rebrand? I mean, to rebrand. Okay. Yeah. Because low key, high key, you know, the, um, hmm. 
you know, the dollar sign symbol that that's, um, uh, that's Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. I trademarked that, not trademarked it. I, um, that's, do you see that? I had yeah. that for years, but I didn't do anything with it and it got swept up, but I still own the trademark actually for that. Um, but it just also goes to show you about mm -hmm. protecting your things. We're actually going to take some questions because yep. I see some good questions coming in. Okay. Beach 315 says, how do I know how? Um, how do I know what I should pay myself? Okay, niche. See, and so this is a good question. So yes. one in the beginning, you're going to look at your business and your business is going to say, girl, I know you want to make a hundred thousand dollars a year. That's cute. So do I, you can't give, but you can't, what is it? You can't squeeze blood from my arm. Turn it. Oh. Turn it. <laughs> <laughs> so niche in the beginning, you're going to look at how much you make, you know, your, 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 your revenue. And you're going to look at how much you spend. And then you're going to see what's left over and you're going to decide how much you're going to save from that. You're going to have to set aside some taxes, you know, um, and then maybe you have some projects upcoming that you want to set, set aside for. And then from that, you're going to say, this is what I can pay myself. So a lot. So the mistake some people make is that the business makes money and it goes directly into their personal checking account. That is a no, 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 no. You have to pay taxes, <laughs> right? You don't want to do that. So you want the any money that comes in at the very least, you should have business checking, business savings. And I like to say, I call it the pot, that the people who pay you should pay the pot and the pot pays you. Mm -hmm. So after the business starts making a decent amount of, of um, money, you might say, I average $3,000 a month in business. And after it's all said and done, there's about 500 of it that I can reasonably say I can get. So now the pot can start to pay you that $500 a month, $250 every pay period or whatever that kind of looks like. And so like it, in the beginning, you might not be able to pay yourself. The business might not pay you. It might be your your daycare business. I mean, it might be like, your, like, like how I was tutoring and babysitting and things like that. So the first few years of business, it couldn't pay me because there was nothing left over in the pot. So you have to first do that is that make sure that the business takes care of its business. It pays people that it has to pay. It pays the bills it has to pay. You're setting aside for taxes. That's why you want to really lean into like an accountant to help you navigate. At the very least, if there's one person I tell people to hire before all else, Marcia, write this down in your notebook crew. Replay crew. You can still be notebook crew too. Replay crew. Get your notebook out. Right? If there's anything, it's, um, I say that like, Oh man, I just forgot it. Y'all got the worst memory. I'm not gonna lie. I have the memory. What was I saying? Let's see. <laughs> so look, so can I piggyback on that? Because yeah. that's what I was saying in the beginning. The the it was the basics. It was those types of misunderstandings when to pay yourself, yeah. right? So it's the blurred line between what's your money and what's the business's money. Yes. Because if you're looking at it like, okay, well, that was all me. They just paid me. It's going into my business account, mm -hmm. but it's me. It's just me over here, you know, mm -hmm. sole proprietorship. So why can't you use that money? So maybe explain that. Well, because, well, one, yes, even if you're a sole proprietor. So I, I remember what I was going to say. I was going to say, and I just lost it just like that. Dang, Tiffany, I need to say Ginkgo Colobo, whatever that stuff is called. Um, <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I know. Before I forget, bookkeeper, which is, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm writing that down as so I'm going to answer your question. So here's why because you are not the business this was it took me 10 years to wrap my head around i'm like but i am the budgetista no i'm not i'm tiffany i'm tiffany the budgetista literally because it is a registered business is a separate entity to me people are not paying tiffany unless i'm a contractor they're paying mm -hmm. the budgetista and before the budgetista can pay me it needs to pay its bills and it needs to pay its taxes and ideally you need to be saving too, you know, and then it can pay you. That's why you can't just go hand to mouth. Cause I did that the first few years and I owed all these taxes and I was like, from what money? Yeah. Cause Tiffany done spent the budget niece's money, you know? And so like, I had to learn mm -hmm. that lesson. So you're wanting to separate. So this is what I was going to say before where my mind was like, before I lose it, I wrote it down. The number one thing, guess, I want you to tell me in the comments, guess who you think you, you should hire first. Marcia, what do people think that they should hire first when you first start to hire? What do you think like off the top that people think they should hire first? The thing that I hear people say first is a virtual assistant. I knew you were going to say that. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> they don't need her. Let me tell you, when I was my own virtual assistant for the first five years, her name was Michelle. So if you email me, Michelle emails you back, ain't no Michelle. Her name is Rose now. That's her real name. Before I was Michelle. You emailed me mm -hmm. and I was like, hello, you have reached the desk of Tiffany. 
<laughs> so I was my own virtual assistant. Yo, people are like, to this day, people are like, Michelle been with you for years, honey. Because when Rose answers my emails, she still answers as Michelle. I just call oh, her. Oh, wow. Her. Yes. But mm -hmm. virtual assistant, mm -mm. it is some form of financial professional, whether it's an accountant or a bookkeeper, because money is the lifeblood of your business. If the blood is not flowing through the body of the business, you don't have a business. Yeah. And so at the very least, to, bookkeepers are not as expensive as people think. You can find something reasonable because it's going to keep you going because when it's time to pay your taxes, you don't want to, oh, I've had friends owe 50, 60, $100,000 in taxes and they don't know what to do. And you get charged daily on that interest. You start mm -hmm. off owing 30, before you know it, you owe 60. And so like I say a bookkeeper or, or an, an, um, an accountant, okay, to start off. Another quick question, how do you know when you're ready for a brick and mortar versus being a mobile business? So it depends. You might not never, I will never be a, a brick and mortar business, not interested, the overhead sounds Same. scary to me. Same. So it really depends, um, Tamika, on what kind of business that you're in. Um, let's just say that you are, I don't know, a mobile uh, bakery. You know, and you've always wanted to have a brick and mortar. The numbers will tell you, you know, you might ask yourself, OK, what? So you have to do the math on what is the overhead to manage a brick and mortar business? How much money do I need to be making to pay those new bills? It's almost like when you're buying a house, right? Like you're in an apartment and you're like, OK, my rent is two thousand dollars a month. If I go to this house, all of the bills added up, not just the mortgage, but any new bill added up will basically be the same, less or more than renting. Can I afford it? And then you can make the decision from there. So the numbers are going to tell you when you're ready to move to a, a brick and mortar business, but you don't have to. There are plenty of very successful businesses that will never have brick and mortar. Okay. All right. So this is really great. Like, so we have just like some quick takeaways because then we're going to, I want to, I want to ask our audience a question and I want to lean in uh, to you some more Marcia. So some quick takeaways that I hope you took away from, from these tips are that one, that like leaning into a financial professional above all else when you start a business, if you're ready to hire. Um, two, that you don't have to work and overwhelm. You don't. Like, do you have to work hard? Yes. Work and overwhelm? No. If you have not shared this video, do you even really like me before we move on? Okay. Share. We are dropping gems. <laughs> right? So two, like I said, like you don't have to work and overwork and overwhelm. Um, uh, three, that... Oh, what were some other things that we took um, myths that we busted today, Marcia? That oh, that you that you have to be a pure entrepreneur. That it is possible mm -hmm. to have one foot at your regular job, one foot, mm -hmm. you know, in your in your business, or have a business, but you have some side hustles, hustles to help you pay the bills. Mm -hmm. That's okay. You know, you get to decide for yourself. And 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 I think one of the biggest myths is that like what you're capable of earning. That literally, there's no cap other than you when it comes to your business that you are capable of earning. I mean, in the last 15 years, you really, I want to say the last five or six years, because of the first 10 years, or five or six years, I didn't really make that much. But in 15 years total, but like I said, the last handful of years, I've made over $30 million in business. This little black girl right here. That's insane. Right? Preschool teacher to this. There's no cap. Now, when I say 30 million in business, I don't mean 30 million for Tiffany. Yeah. That's why I say I'm not the budgetista business yeah. because if it was 30 million for Tiffany, I'm not gonna lie, we'd be doing this, and I'd be like, uh, a mocktail, please. Yeah, <laughs> <Or pineapple. laughs> back to y'all. <laughs> I, I like that you make that distinction. Yeah, yes, it's very important. Gross versus net. Gross means all of it, net means minus all the expenses, what's left over, you know. But I just want you to understand that, like, it there is no cap, you know, that that's a hopefully a myth that we busted. Yeah. Any other myths that you think we bust? Let me know. Okay. So real quick, I want you in the comments. If you haven't already live crew and replay crew, tell us about your entrepreneur goals for 2023. Like I said before, I love to hear from you because it helps me to create the tools and resources you need for success. Um, so let's see some of the, like our entrepreneur goals. Like I want to see, like, I'm going to read some of them out loud. Um, and so, Marcia, while we're waiting for people to kind of like flood in with their entrepreneur goals, what are some of your goals, your entrepreneur goals for, for 2023? Do they have to be, uh, do they have to have a monetary value? No, not at all. Not okay. even a little bit. I want more media opportunities. Okay. Yeah. But it's like, so what would that look like ideally? Like, give me your, like, I want to be on what? So um, all the things, but no, but so, th so this is what it is. 
I want a platform to talk to talk more about grief recovery. I don't think it gets the visibility that it needs. And I don't think people seek the grief support that they need. Okay. So if you ask 10 women what their goals are for 2023, personally, mm-hmm. they're, six out of 10 is gonna, are going to say self-care. Okay. Okay. But what shape does self-care take? Mm-hmm. And why isn't healing from trauma, some life event that you're going through, why isn't that a part of? your healing. So that's what I want to talk about. I want to make grief a more visible thing because when you experience a life event, Mm -hmm. you're experiencing grief alongside of it, right? Mm -hmm. Loss of security, loss of stability, Mm -hmm. loss of trust, but then sometimes actual loss, you know, the death of a person and nobody really stops to work on that healing. So that's what I want to take to mainstream audiences. What are you actually doing to work on your healing, not just dealing with grief, but healing. Okay. So, So, and I, someone just said that they're grieving right now, sis. And me too. You know, y'all know that I lost my husband um, a year ago and yesterday was Valentine's day and it didn't really hit me, but today I was knocked out. I mean, like I I take a walk every day just to like woosa, meditative walk. I Mm. thought of him and thought about how Valentine's day, because I'm not really big and sentimental and things like that, but Mm. The love that, what I love so much about him that he didn't just love me, he loved around me, through me, Mm. meaning like Mm. he would get my sister's flowers for Valentine's Day. My Mm. niece and my nephew, he would get them. I have a picture of where he he would always decorate our dining room with like balloons and teddy bears and things for like me, my bonus daughter, Alyssa, my niece and my nephew would come over. And I I just remember that loss and I was in the park bawling, honey. Yeah, I was like, this was not my attention, you know? And so I love that like, So for me, and I'm going to share because you guys are sharing some amazing um, goals for your entrepreneurship journey. One of the goals for my entrepreneurship entrepreneurship journey, this is why I appreciate you so much, Marcia, is to leave space for that grief. I can't do what I used to do before. I refuse to overwork and overwhelm. I refuse. I refuse Mm -hmm. that like I need space and grace to grieve and mourn as well as pour into y'all. But I can't give you everything like I used to give before. Yeah, you know, I, I love can't. these boundaries. I love the boundaries. You know? So here's some of the, the from the audience. Um, Nakisha, she says she wants to learn how to get capital. Yvonne Moore, um, she says she wants to get her business up and running and to at least to earn fifty thousand dollars. I'm assuming in business or personally. Um, what else? What else? What else? There's some really great uh, goals. Um, I'm so sorry, Denise. She says she lost her husband in 2020. So I know that pain, unfortunately, well. And you're still healing, and we will always mm-hmm. heal. Um, Let's yep. see. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Um, goal. She wants to, um, Kim wants to automate passive income or two or more streams and grants. Cherie says she wants a, re- a revenue increase, social media presence to consistently pay herself. Mm-hmm. Um, Kim says to automate. Oh, we already did that one. Um, you guys have some amazing, keep sharing whether it's replay or live crew, you know, because like I said, these are the what you share, I get to use to develop specific resources and tools and things to help dream catchers to live life well and to live mm-hmm. fully now. Mm-hmm. Um, I love this. Artista says she wants to help 20 families, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, yes, I just like, yeah, like I just like, oh, you guys are so sweet. Like That sounds for- like one of your challenges. <laughs> exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So these are just really great. Like, um, okay, one more. Rosie says, I want to work with two clients a month to be able to pay for um, grants, uh, um, for grant evaluation services um, at her monthly rate. And so like, these are things like the more specific you can be about your goals, um, the better. You know, so now that you shared your goals, I want you to keep me in the loop. Tell us what are you going to be doing to reach these goals? So I hope you understand this is that when you share, you learn twice. So the reason why I'm asking Marcia and I'm asking you guys to share is because it's not just some old, oh, share. No, because when you write the things down, like yeah. a study was done, I don't know, it was Harvard or Princeton, where they followed people who wrote down their goals. That's why I said notebook crew. If you're not part of the notebook crew, what you doing? That they followed people who wrote down their goals 10 years later, and they found that the vast majority of people who wrote them down achieved them versus those who did not. Mm-hmm. So even if you don't write a notebook crew, the act of you writing it in the comments is powerful. Yeah. You give voice to the thing. 
you know, writing it down in your notebook, writing it down in the comments. I want you to give voice to the thing. Plus, as you share your goals and what you're like, I want you to right now, what are you, what steps are you taking? It allows other people then to learn from the thing that you're sharing. Okay. It's so hold you accountable. To, yes. <laughs> you know? And if, like I said, if you're, if you're tuning in later, you're part of the replay crew, still share because it's still so valuable. Like, I don't know if you know this, Marcia, but more people watch later than they do live. Oh, Did you know that? Okay. On the replay. Okay. Yes. So just in general, right? Because, and so as a result of that, that means replay crew, what you're sharing is so powerful. And th those of you who are watching live, because there'll be more people who will watch this later and read your comments and say, I'm so glad she wrote that. So don't mm -hmm. hold back. This mm -hmm. is a safe space to share. What are your goals and what specific steps are you going to take to achieve those goals? Okay. Yes. All right. So, you know, like I'm so excited. I just hope that this was like, um, super duper, uh, um, helpful. And so, so, um, I want to tell you, I want to thank you for listening to our conversation. Let me just make sure, child, let me make sure. Cause I have my notes. I'm like, is it in order, sis? Cause if you know me, <laughs> it might not be. And I think it is in order. <laughs> yes. So I just want to make sure. I was like, Tiffany, what are your, where are your notes? And so I want to thank you for listening to our conversation about building business ownership and wealth and sharing your 2023 financial goals with us. Here's the thing. We're going to be back next Wednesday, February 20, 22nd at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Same time, same place. Don't go yet because we're going to, I just want you, I just, I, before I forget, I don't, I don't want to forget to thank you for being here, Marcia. I want to thank you so much um, for being here, but you know, I have something else. One, one, one last thing to ask you, like we've had a lot of discussion about generational wealth over the years. Like what was the moment um, when you knew that um, you needed a plan to build generational wealth? Like you said before that in the beginning, it was just, I was just trying to make sure I could be home with the baby, but like, yeah. what is the shift that happened for you? The shift that happened for me was that there was no longer a 401k or employee match and there was no mm -hmm. retirement plan. I wanted to still be able to pay for college for my kids and I wanted to still be able to retire comfort comfortably. Okay. So that is when I got really focused. You know, like I already said, I was, I was, I was disciplined enough to live on less, but because I was able to live on less, I was able to put the money, the, the surplus, the excess, of what I was already living off of, I was able to start investing that. Can I, can I talk about that? So in the beginning, it was just, you know, whatever I, I made and I wasn't touching, I was just putting into a high interest savings account. But I was able to get a little more savvy and then at least put that into index funds. And when I say living on less, I mean living on next to nothing. Like you mm -hmm. talk about your noodle budget, mm -hmm. I could start living off of $15,000 a year, $20,000 a year. When I did the math and you know how people talk about um, five times your annual salary and plan to to retire with that, mm -hmm. that would be that would have been forty thousand dollars living mm -hmm. on forty thousand dollars to try to you know retire with a million dollars. I was living on way less than that, so I could still save for my retirement, save for my college, my my kids' college, because that's that that was really what I wanted to focus on. Beyond that, if they've got a good education, look, you on your own after that. If I provide you with the education, you can fly. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that 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 was the priority. I realized if this is what I'm doing on my own, then there isn't a boat coming to save me. There isn't going to be this miraculous money that falls from the sky and takes care of me, you know, financially. So I just put the money towards towards my retirement and towards the kids. So I think. I think for me, like thinking about that, that, that I, the shift for me with building generational wealth was like, when I realized like for me, that home ownership was going to be a critical component. I actually close on a home tomorrow. Um, my, my, um, the condo, mm -hmm, the condo. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, I paid off my parents' house because I didn't want them to worry. Um, but I, I just, I realized for me that like, that if I'm, if for us to be super stable, because the, the statistics don't lie. I mean, I know people say, oh, rent, rent, rent. There's nothing wrong with renting. But for me, like my parents bought their house when I was nine or 10 for $250,000. Mm -hmm. The house is now worth over a million dollars. And, you know, I mean, I'm, that's 30 years later, but that's tr tremendous, yeah. you know? And so I just like, I just want us to understand that like black generational wealth is feasible and possible and, and that one of the 
tools that we can use to get there. You know, for those of you who are in that space, certainly is entrepreneurship. And so I just, like I said, again, I want to thank you guys for coming. I want to, I hope that you got so much value um, from today. Um, I hope that if you are a business owner or a pre-business owner or thinking about it, that you're encouraged to know that I was not an overnight success. You know, I really didn't start making money. You know, I didn't start making what I made as a preschool teacher until like five years into business. And I didn't start making real money until about 10 years into business. But now here I am, you know, like I am a, a, a millionaire, you know, that's not going to be everyone's story, but, yeah. but it's certainly, you could certainly grow, create a business that can create um, a different financial reality for those people who come after you and for the, for where you are now. So mm -hmm. I hope this is really helpful. I hope we will see you next week, February 22nd. Mark your calendars. Uh, we've got some good notes that you've taken. Um, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And can we just tell Marcia, just thank you so much. I Can you just like let, let her know in the comments? You know, because we get to, we can see your comments. So <laughs> yes, if you could just... Yes, rich auntie vibes. Wait till you see my car. You follow me on, on, on the socials because I would be in the story showing you the before and the after. Okay. Yes. Because my house now is very cozy, you know, beautiful, cozy house. No, my apartment's going to be rich auntie vibes, honey. <laughs> You're going to have a special room for the kids. Yeah. Well, ah, you can't touch all this over here. This is auntie's living room. <laughs> here, the kids can go everywhere. <laughs> Thank you, Marcia. I love it. All right, y'all. See you next week. <laughs> Bye.